Okay, welcome to Ground Control and part four in the review series of the Volantex P51. This is going to be the last video in the review of this plane. It is a, the plug and fly version. It's 750 millimeter wingspan, which is 29.7 inches. All right, I have a lot of information to disseminate. One piece of information that I'm always looking for, but I never see in the information on the planes when they're listed online, is the dimensions of the battery bay. Uh, before I like to, before I buy a plane, I like to know if I have a a lipo in my inventory that's going to work in the plane. And you know, first part of that is does it fit? Will it fit in the battery bay? So I'm going to give you the dimensions of the battery bay on this plane. It is 66 millimeters by 32 millimeters by 22 millimeters. So you want to make sure that your lipo of choice does not exceed those dimensions or you will not get it in the battery bay. I did have an opportunity to run up the stock motor and prop on the bench. I used a different ESC just to see if it was that was issue with the ESC or if it was with the motor. The amp usage that I got at full throttle was identical to the amount of amp draw I got on the load meter when it was in the plane stock with the 10 amp speed controller. I used a Favorite Sky 1 20 amp speed controller, 2 to 3 Fs with a 5 volt 2 amp back. It's the same speed controller that I used to test the Racer Star BR. 2208 1400 kV motor which I have in there now. So the amperage was still 11.68 amps. The amount of thrust that it produced at a 100% throttle was really good. It was 420 grams. The all up weight on the plane with the two cell lipo that I was using which is a GMB 450 milliamp hour 2S 80C slash 60C LiPo, but I was only getting three minutes flight time out of it before I had to land. And with that battery, the all up weight was 333.5 grams, which gives you a thrust to weight ratio of 1.25 to 1, which is really good. But you are going to, if you're going to run it um, off of a two cell, um, you're, you're going to want a larger capacity 2S LiPo to go in this plane. Now I am still under the opinion that there's an issue with that with the stock motor that I had in this this specific plane, the motor that came in this plane that I received. I don't know if it's weak magnets or if it's bad windings. Maybe the bearings are way too tight. I don't know, but I don't think that on a 2S lipo it should have been pulling. It shouldn't have been pulling more amps than my 2208 1400 kV on a 3S and it was pulling two amps more on a 2S LiPo than what this motor is pulling on a 3S LiPo and I just don't think that's right uh, and that's just my opinion. Alright so the replacement power system um, which I just spoke about the all up weight with the GNB 550 milliamp hour 3S LiPo which is a, another 80C slash 60C and and uh, the uh, 452s's and the 553s's that I have of the GMBs, both of those batteries are are almost brand new. They have very few flights on, maybe four or five flights. So um, the batteries were not an issue in this plane. That put the all up weight along with the reinforcement and repair I made on the landing gear. You know everything that I did to the plane after I came back and changed out the the power system and did the repair. It's 367.3 grams. At full throttle, it produces 524 grams of thrust. At 50% um, throttle, it produces 206 grams of thrust. And at full throttle, the amperage was, amp pull was 9.69 amps, which gives it a thrust to weight ratio of 1.4 to 1. So, so yeah, when you looked at the uh, two flight videos in the in the last uh, part three of, the, of this review, you could see um, you could see the power that this plane had when I was flying it around. So it does have a much better thrust to weight ratio than the stock setup had, and now it's a 3S system instead of a 2S system. 
but uh, the stock system was just fine. You know, if I if I hadn't gotten a, a motor that was that was pulling that many amps when I don't think it should, I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have changed out the the stock system on it. That uh, 1.25 to one thrust to weight ratio it was plenty to to get this plane to do whatever you wanted it to do. Okay, so. The stock prop setup, the way that the stock prop is attached on that 3 millimeter shaft on this plane, I don't like it. There's no way to hang on to the shaft to keep it from turning when you're trying to tighten down the prop. So here's a tip for you. This is what, this is what I would do if I still have the stock power system in it. I would take a file or I would take a Dremel tool. And of course this is just, just for your reference, but I would take a Dremel tool or a file and at about the last five millimeters of that shaft that's sticking out past the retaining nuts to hold the hold the cowl the, the prop cowl and the prop and everything on i would file the threads off of the last five millimeters of that on the top and on the bottom to opposite each other so you've got two flats where you could take a pair of needle nut pliers or a regular set of pliers whatever and hold that shaft to keep it from turning while you're tightening the nuts down or or if you're changing out a prop you need to loosen it and then tighten it again believe me that's going to be a much easier way of doing it so that's what i would do if i was if i still have the stock system in if you guys want to do that i think it'll be a a huge help in changing out those props okay i want to cover the show and tell tutorial on how i reinforce the landing gear on this plane after gluing my retaining clip that I ripped out of the wing and letting that cure, I took some scrap pieces of foam, Adam's Ready Board, with the paper removed from the top and the bottom, and I cut them to size and I glued those in around all of the recessed areas around that clip on the sides and in the back, not in the front yet, but on the sides and in the back. And then once that was cured, I took some additional glue and using a scrap piece of foam, I troweled that glue in across all those pieces, to fill in all the nooks and crannies and level it out, and I let all that cure. And then I took some scrap pieces of plastic, and this plastic is two millimeters thick, but you could, you could use one millimeter thick material, it'd be plenty strong enough. But here's an example of the material I use. This is a handle, a plastic handle from a retail box. I think this came from the Flybear P38. And this material is the plate that the handle actually fit into in the lid of the retail box. So it already had slots cut out of it that I could use for attaching the landing gear. So I made sure that I cut these pieces wide enough that it was going to cover the foam on the wing on each side of the retaining clip in the front and in the back because the idea is to relieve the pressure on those clips so I wanted to cover some additional foam area when I did that so I cut these these uh, little plastic plates to size to do that and I'll throw another picture up on the screen so you can see what I'm talking about once I cut those to size on the um, the surface that was going to be glued onto the the foam of the wing, I took an X-Acto blade and I just scored a waffle pattern into that plastic to give the glue something to grab onto. And then I took a 0.5 millimeter drill bit and I drilled holes all across the surface of that plastic plate to also give the glue something to adhere to. Now, once I completed that, I, I slotted my landing gear through the plate and then taped the plate up out of the way and then I glued the landing gear into the clip. So this is, this is a permanent uh, attachment of the landing gear. If you want to be able to take the landing gear off again, you, you don't want to do this. I, I cannot belly land a plane out where I fly because it would just tear up the plane. So I have to have landing gear on here. I'm not going to be removing it. So this works for me. So once the glue cured on the landing gear being glued into the clips, 
and then I covered that surface area with additional glue and then attached the, the plates, the reinforcement plates for the landing gear and let that set up. And as you could see from um, flying out there in the review part three video, the landing gear is held up very well. And then when I, when I show you the outtakes of the review on this plane, you will see that that um, not only is the plane extremely durable, but the landing gear is now extremely durable as well. So that's exactly how I reinforce the landing gear on this plane. I think it's, it's worked extremely well, and I don't think I'm going to have another problem with that landing gear. So that's how I did that. All right, um, so so now that you know how, how I did the reinforcement of that, now let's talk about the setup of the plane for a successful maiden flight. And I think that the settings that I have on here now will not only give you a, a successful maiden flight, but but um, I, I don't think I'm gonna have to tweak it much at all. I think that the, I think that the maneuverability of the plane, uh, the way I have it now, is, is pretty darn good. I mean, you, you've seen it do the rolls and the loops and the split S maneuvers. And it seems to have plenty of aileron, plenty of elevator, plenty of rudder. So, I also want to let you know the aileron, I was impressed by this, the ailerons are asymmetrical. So, you know when the, when the prop is spinning, it wants to, the, the torque from the motor wants to roll the plane to the left. So I noticed when I was checking the throws on the ailerons, that on the right hand side, when the, when the uh, aileron is coming up, it has much more travel on the left side than it does on the right. They deliberately made the movement of the ailerons asymmetrical, which I think is pretty cool, because what they're trying to do is provide more roll torque on the right hand side than on the left hand side so that they can counteract the torque roll from the motor. So you should get pretty even roll rates going either left or right. So I thought that was pretty neat that they thought of doing that. So on my left aileron, I have eight millimeters of movement in both directions, eight millimeters up, eight millimeters down. And I measured, I measured the um, deflection of the aileron right here on the inside where the cutout of the aileron is. On the, on the very inside extent of the aileron is where I measured the movement, eight millimeter. The right aileron moves 14 millimeters up and eight millimeters down. So it has, it has uh, six millimeters further travel going up to counteract that motor torque. That's what mine has after I adjusted the throws on it. On the elevator, on the elevator where I measure the throw is, is right where the cutout is for the rudder, right where the control horn is, right here on this edge, on this corner right here, that's where I've measured my throws on the elevator. On the elevator, I have 10 millimeters of travel up, 10 millimeters of travel down. On the rudder, I have 10 millimeters of movement in both in either direction left and right, 10 millimeters left and right, so 20 millimeters total travel. The amount of expo that I have in the plane, on the aileron I have, I have 25% expo. I like my ailerons to be fairly, fairly responsive, not too responsive, but fairly responsive. I don't like them to feel mushy and, uh, and having the ailerons at 25% expo really feels good to me. On the elevator, I have 35% expo. Um, a lot of planes, I think, have, are pretty twitchy with the elevator. So at mid-throttle, I like a little bit of cushion on the elevator. And on the rudder, 25% expo. Now, I also changed the scale in my transmitter on some of these control surfaces on these channels. So on the aileron channel, I have a scale of 120% on my transmitter for the ailerons. That gives you a little bit better resolution. On the elevator, I have 125% scale, and on the rudder, 100% scale. So um, that works for me, and I think if you start out with that setup, I think that you'll you'll have a very successful maiden. It's nice, and, and you know, holds its line. Um, the movements are not abrupt. 
but you still have enough deflection in the control surface to get you out of trouble if you get into trouble. So I would start with that. Now, uh, the other thing that I did with the ailerons, um, you, have to rem you have to remove the main wing, but the aileron control rods were connected to the servo control arm at the center holes. I moved the, those control rods out to the outer holes to give me mo more throw on the ailerons. Now the control, the control arm that they have on the servo, the holes are one millimeter and the control rods are two millimeter control rods. So they drilled out those center holes in order to put those connecting rods in there. So if you move it, you're gonna to have to drill those holes out to two millimeter, which is what I did. So I have mine on the very outside holes on the servo control arm. And that gives me plenty of deflection on the ailerons along with the scale that I have. Um, you saw that the, the roll rate, you know, I think for a P51 Mustang, I thought the roll rate was pretty good when I tested on the 3S setup. Okay, so now, now that I've given you all the information, the adjustments, uh, the tip, modifications that I've made to the landing gear, repair, and other information on this plane, now the question is, would I buy this plane again? And the answer is, yeah, I would. For the price that they sell, I mean, it's a beautiful looking plane. Uh, it's a beautiful looking P-51 Mustang. The biggest problem was the landing gear, and I don't like the way the prop attaches on the stock motor and shaft, but that's a quick, that's an easy fix. If you file off the threads, top and bottom, so you got two flats, to grip that shaft, you're not going to have any problem getting the getting the nuts tightened down on the prop or loosen it if you have to change it out. That was my biggest complaint uh, about that was how cumbersome that was. I wish they had would have they would have put flats on the end of that shaft so that you had something to grab a hold of. But that will make it ten times easier. The the um, reinforcement of the landing gear was using household material. It doesn't take a lot of time. You need to let the glue set up, but actually doing the reinforcement doesn't take much time. It actually looks pretty decent, and uh, and it's gonna and it works. It's definitely gonna keep that landing gear on the plane. All right. So, and the fact that I got a motor that's pulling far too many amps, in my opinion, on a 2S LiPo. If if you know Banggood sent me this plane for review. Um, if, if I had had more time um, after I received the plane before I, you know, I wanted to get the review done, I would have contacted Banggood and say, hey, I got a bad motor. I need you to send me a replacement motor. I would have had to wait you know, probably two to four weeks to get the replacement motor, which would have extended uh, the time before I could get started on the review. And I chose not to do that because I had a motor and a speed controller that I could put in this plane and run off of a 3S. But a 1.25 to 1 thrust to weight ratio on a 2S system is good power. You, you don't have to upgrade the power system. It just so happened I got a bad motor. So at $114.99, $115 for a plug and fly for this plane, I definitely think it's worth it. And you saw the way it was flying out there. And once I got the landing gear back on it, got it reinforced, got it set up with enough power, um, it was a joy to fly, and it's a lot of fun. And I'm going to be putting a lot of light posts through this plane. So thanks for watching. Please give a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you in the air.